After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Milstein Hall at Cornell University. A line drawn around the boundary between the inside and the outside of Milstein Hall would include the basement slab, foundation walls, first floor glazing, aluminum soffit panels, thin marble veneer, second floor glazing, more marble veneer, the green or vegetated roof, and then more of the same coming down on the other side, forming a closed circuit. Such a closed circuit constitutes the building enclosure and actually consists of several critical elements or layers characteristic of modern enclosure systems. These layers, which can be literally separate and distinct or combined in various ways, control the movement of liquid water, gaseous water or water vapor, air, and heat between the inside and outside spaces defined by the enclosure. Thus, we get four control layers, an air barrier, vapor retarder, water barrier, and thermal insulation. Each layer should be continuous, since the things being controlled, vapor, water, air, or other gases, and heat, are continuously present at the building's surface. Control is needed to ensure that the levels or amounts of the things being controlled that are desired inside the control layers are brought about as efficiently as possible given the uncontrollable nature of the levels encountered outside. In practice, many commercial or institutional buildings combine the air, water, and vapor control functions into a single membrane with the fourth control layer, insulation, keeping the membrane warm so that internally generated moisture will not condense should it reach the membrane's interior surface during periods of cold weather. Milstein Hall's stone veneer works in this manner. It is just an open rain screen protecting the insulation, which in turn covers the combined air-water vapor barrier, which has been applied to the gypsum sheathing. The green roof and foundation wall also have a single air-water vapor membrane covered with insulation. While the spray foam covering the soffit and the curtain wall glazing each combine all four required layers, including the insulation, into a single impermeable barrier or assembly. The vertical surfaces attached to or hanging from the structural frame are known as the curtain wall, which is the primary subject of this video. Curtain wall systems also have a more technical definition within the building trades, distinguished by their performance and quality from other glazed walls, such as storefront systems. Here, we use the term curtain wall in a non-technical sense, referring to any and all materials and systems forming a vertical enclosure that are attached to, rather than themselves constituting the building's structural system. Other elements of the building enclosure system, the soffit, stone veneer, insulated slabs, domes, foundation walls, and vegetated roof, are discussed in other parts of this video series. The glazed curtain wall starts with the completion of the structural frame. Here is a sample of the curtain wall framing tees that was delivered to the contractor's trailer. These tees are bolted together, forming a rectangular grid that will support heavy insulated glass panels along their edges. A series of threaded rods are welded to the faces of these tees. These engage and support the curtain wall system. When the weather gets cold during the construction process, plastic sheets are placed between the vertical tees. Here we can see the temporary wooden frames that hold the plastic in place. From the inside, the angles that hold the tees together and tie them to the structural frame can also be seen. In preparation for the glazing, a special metal section is fastened onto the threaded rods that were welded to the tees. This metal already holds rubberized gaskets that will create a seal between the glass and metal, as well as cushioning the glass so that it can be tightened against these supports without cracking. Let's go outside through this temporary door designed not by the architect, but by carpenters working for the contractor. We're looking up at the curtain wall of Milstein Hall being constructed. The structural tees are in place, and uh, the next step is to put the glass in there. The glass panels arrive ready to be lifted into place. They consist of three glass layers. The two interior layers are actually laminated together. Then there is an airspace, and then the third layer of glass. A metal channel is glued to the inside surface of the laminated layers. The glass is not held in place by conventional mullions. Instead, it will be clipped into place by metal tabs inserted into these channels. The glass is hoisted into place with these vacuum lifters. 
Then workers position the glass and make the final attachments using metal tabs inserted into the glazing channel and bolted into the same metal strips that contain the gaskets. From the inside, one can see the structural tees, the gasket, the metal channel glued to the laminated glass, and then the glass itself. From the outside, all visual evidence of the curtain wall's elaborate fastening system is covered with a sealant joint. At this angle, viewed from Sibley Hall, the glass becomes quite reflective, and it appears that the sealant is being applied from both the outside and inside simultaneously by highly coordinated twins. The finished sealant joint appears as a black vertical line between the glass panels. Meanwhile, horizontal bands of stainless steel flashing are fastened at the top and bottom edges of the sheathing. A cold applied self-adhering membrane consisting of a 3 mil high density cross laminated polyethylene film coated on one side with a 22 mil layer of rubberized asphalt adhesive is used as another flashing material to connect the air water vapor barrier not yet installed to the stainless steel. Once the sprayed on air barrier is applied to the sheathing and a sealant joint is applied between the glazing and the stainless steel flashing, the air barrier system will be perfectly continuous. The detailing to accomplish this continuity is a bit complex, so let's examine a schematic detailed section to see how it works, taken at the edge of the studio floor. The actual construction may differ just a bit, but this will provide a pretty accurate picture. Start with the steel structure with its outriggers and a substantial structural angle forming a pore stop for the concrete that is cast into a corrugated steel deck. Then weld the steel studs to this angle and screw in the sheathing to the studs. Next, attach the structural tees which act as supports for the glass. These tees are joined together by steel angles that are in turn welded to the steel angle forming the slab edge. They have threaded rods, like small bolts, welded to them. Let's look at this connection in three dimensions to see the elements more clearly. The vertical tee and the horizontal tees at floor level are connected with clip angles. The clip angles are welded to the metal pore stop. The green surface is the air barrier applied to the sheathing, and this is one of the threaded rods welded to the vertical T. These rods accept the metal screw plate with integral rubberized gaskets to which the glazing channel is attached. So here's the glazing with its glued on channel. Metal tabs inserted into this channel are screwed into the screw plate with its integral channel, like a miniature unistrut, to actually support the heavy glass panels. Since there are no conventional mullions or rails to hold the glass directly, the glass support really depends on the glued joint between the inner surface of the laminated light and the metal channel. At this point, it becomes possible to install the air water vapor barrier. We'll refer to it from now on as just the air barrier. First, stainless steel flashing is attached from the glass down to the sheathing. Self-adhered rubberized flashing tape is then applied to connect the stainless steel and the sheathing surface. Finally, a two-part sprayed-on product is applied to the surface of the gypsum sheathing, also covering the rubberized flashing. But to make this truly continuous, the flashing must be connected to the material it seeks to join. So, first a backer rod is inserted, and then a sealant is applied between the stainless steel flashing and the bottom of the glass. The air barrier is now continuous. The ground level glazing is at once more complex in its geometry, but more conventional in its construction. Up at the soffit we can see how a steel stud partition is hung from the structure above in order to provide a top surface to which the mullions for this glazing can be attached, but also to provide a wall surface on which sprayed foam insulation can be applied so that the thermal barrier can be made continuous from the horizontal soffit to the glass itself. Here you can see how sloping mullions are attached with clip angles to the top surface and then again at the bottom. Where mullion attachment must be hidden, extruded aluminum sections are screwed into the vertical sections around which horizontal aluminum rails can be inserted. We can see at this corner mullion how metal bars are screwed into the main mullion to hold the glass in place. This glass is incredibly thick. You can get a sense of its thickness from the width of these black inserts that will be covered eventually by an aluminum faceplate. The thickness is not only due to the large size of each glass light, also the glass has laminations to provide acoustical isolation for the auditorium it encloses. Where the glass is installed at the lobby on the other side of this wall, it need not be acoustically isolated nor as thick. 
Here we see a worker creating sample aluminum cover plate conditions at the lobby corner to try to match the thicker condition at the auditorium side while maintaining the same apparent profile. After the glass is in place, lighting fixtures are built into the mullion profiles on the exterior side. One is already damaged and will be replaced. Here we see metal guards being installed in front of the sloping glass after the building is already occupied. The guards were not specified in the original design, even though required by building codes and ADA guidelines. Other guards under the concrete dome were also either extended, like this one, or added as afterthoughts, long after the building was initially occupied. And like those interior guardrails, the guards at the ground level glazing were found necessary to protect humans from injuring themselves by coming into direct and unintended contact with this work of architecture. Such are the potential conflicts between the subjective formal idealism of Milstein Hall and the need for accessibility and safety in the actual world. Yeah.